Bibles are there and the chairs in front of you. Uh, we like to read from the same translation so that you can follow along and then the understanding comes a little quicker. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, open it up today. Go to the book of Genesis and just hold your places there. The book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. It's the book of the origin of mankind. Amen. Amen. The origin of, the beginning of. It's Genesis is the book upon which all 65 other books rest. That's right. Amen. It's the foundation. And we're going through the book of Genesis and we're enjoying and learning a lot. Amen. Amen. Are you getting a lot out of the book of Genesis as we've been studying it together? Amen. Amen. We can relate a lot to the Old Testament saints. A lot of things that they've gone through or went through, we, are go, we go through. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So today the title, the Lord, um, when we were on our retreat, of course I already had my title and my message done before the retreat, but I love when I seek the Lord for a title and He gives me these wonderful titles, especially if now that I'm preaching in chronological, in a chapter after chapter, I always have to ask the Lord for titles because... There's so many chapters, it would be impossible to do a series on the book of Genesis because y'all know there's a lot of chapters in there, amen? amen? So I ask him for a title each time I go to a new chapter, and we know we left off in chapter 35 before, and we didn't finish the last part of the chapter of 35, but I hope that you go home and read through it and do the homework on that. It just talks about some, some events that occurred, and we're going to leave that. I'm going to leave that with you guys today to go do homework on chapter, the end of chapter 35 where we left off. But we're going to begin today in chapter 36, and the title of today's message is Unholy Alliances. Ooh, hallelujah. Ooh, can I get an amen? amen? Unholy Alliances. Thank you, Lord. There is nothing worse in this life, church, than being yoked up with the wrong person, or with the wrong people. Amen. It can happen in a relationship. It can happen in friendships. Or it could be in a business relationship. Or I'll say business ship. It's not a word. I just made that up. Business ship. Any of these unholy alliances can lead you down a road you don't want to go. Speak holy. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How do we know? Because 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and 14 says it like this. And this is from the King James I'm quoting. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship with righteousness hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? The NLT, what we read from, says it this way in the beginning of it. It says, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. Amen. The Holman translation, which I love when I was studying, says it this way. Do not be mismatched with unbelievers. <laughs> but pastor... <laughs> This is who God has for me. I know it. I, I love them. They love me. Been with them for a long time. And, and we're in love. And you just don't understand, Pastor. This is the one. They don't go to church. They believe in God. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but they don't serve God. This is the one for me. And I believe this is the way it should be. But, Pastor, this is the one I want to be in business with. Their life's not together. They can't run their own household, but I know you, they call me, you, I feel like I should be in business with this person. But these are my friends. I've known them for 20 years. I can't let go of my friends. You won't understand, Pastor. These are my best friends that I grew up with in school, and these are my best friends. I, I know that they do things, but that's who I want to hang around with. Let me tell you what the Bible says about that. Proverbs 16 and 25 says this. There is a way that seemeth right unto man. There is a way that seemeth right unto a woman. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Does that mean I'm going to die because I married the wrong person? Or who God told me not to marry? Does this mean I'm going to I'm gonna uh, die because I went into business with somebody I, I, didn't, I shouldn't have been going into business with? That's an extreme case. Those things do happen. But the ways of death are what? Death to your circumstances for not following what the Lord, what the word of the Lord says. Come on. Amen. Death to what? Your mental. Have you ever seen a person go through a bad breakup when they were with the wrong person? Amen. You see it in the world. How much worse is it for a Christian to be yoked up with somebody from the world and then turn around and have a breakup? That's the word. Amen. It's, it's, it's devastating. It's devastating. But, but, but that person, I, I met them in the church. They were going to church. But is that where their Christianity began and ended was in the church? What did they do outside of the church? How did they live? you got to test their armor. Somebody asked me, Pastor, well, if I meet someone, and you know our church is not very big, so I, I'm not going to have a lot of chances of meeting somebody here. 
So I mean, I, I had my husband come to me in a church with 15 people. So, Hallelujah! And I and I didn't tell him to come to the church. No. I was in a small church before, way before this, <laughs> years back. My my first church where I was really trained, and um, I didn't I didn't ask. Uh, Pastor Jesse to come there when we were friends at that time. I just went on my life and I just thought my life was going on His life was going one way and I didn't I didn't think I was gonna end up marrying him But he came into the doors of the church with 15 people Hallelujah, we know people today that are in large churches have been a lot. I'm talking churches with thousands Amen. A couple thousand more than a couple thousand They've been going to large churches for years and they still haven't found that person. <laughs> so it's according to your faith, and it's according to what you're willing to give up in order to have God to send you that mate or that person you're believing for. Praise Young people, man. do not be yoked up with unbelievers. Don't be mismatched with unbelievers. Right. Don't hang out. He said bad company corrupts good behavior. Good right. behavior doesn't enhance bad company. Amen. That's good, Pastor. You see, there was a way that seems right unto man. There's a way that seems right in our own eyes, but the end thereof is death. There was a way that seemeth right unto Esau, unto his own eyes. But it was the Lord that examined his heart. This is Jacob's brother Esau. Mm -hmm. His decisions, his unrepentant heart, and his unholy alliances brought about severe consequences to him, to his family, to his descendants. What happened to them? Genesis chapter 36, everybody there with me? Unholy alliances. It happens time and time again. Christians, we're talking to the body of Christ, right? I'm not talking to the world. What's our relationship with the world? How was our relationship with the unbeliever? We share Jesus Christ and him crucified. We share the gospel of truth. We share the good news with the unbeliever. Hallelujah. And Pastor Jesse and I form relationships, distant ones, and we, we, we scout across and look for a heart that's ready to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. <laughs> we're kind to people. We, we're, we're, we know, we're nice to people. We know we're the salt and light of the earth. That's our responsibility to the unbeliever. That's right. Hallelujah. So Genesis chapter 36, starting at verse 1. Now, obviously, if you've read this at all or if you went ahead and read, if some of you did that, you're going to see a lot of uh, the names of the descendants. We're not going to cover, obviously, every single name and every single descendant because you will be asleep on the floor by the time we finish this chapter if I did that. Amen. We don't want to put you guys to sleep. Amen. So we're going to read and then we're going to do, um, we're going to uh, interface with other scriptures. Hallelujah. Amen. So everybody there with me at Genesis chapter 36. Yes. Verse 1, this is the account of the descendants of Esau, also known as Edom. Esau married two young women from Canaan. Stop right there. Oh boy. Esau married two young women from Canaan. Oh boy. Two. Well, the, all the saints from old got married to more than one wife. Wasn't that okay? I mean, God didn't, obviously didn't do anything about it, did he? Why did God allow polygamy back then? I'm going to give you all the answer if you don't already know it. The first one. Back then, if you all know, there was a lot of wars. And they were brutal. There was a lot of killings. And a lot of men were at war. So the men were being killed off rapidly. Amen? The women were outnumbering the men. So the women, because they needed protection, they needed to be provided for, they needed to be helped back then because God forbid that they'd be sold into prostitution or slavery. God allowed the men to marry more than one woman because women were outnumbering the men because men were dying off a lot faster during war. That's the first one. Second reason, and there's going to probably be other, but these are the main two reasons I found, I found in my studies. Second reason is expansion of humanity and multiplication on the earth. God wanted to, to be fruitful and multiply. Amen? Amen? So that's why God allowed it. He did not ordain it. He did not command it. Man did that in the earth. Who was the first one to do polygamy in the, in the Bible? Lamech, Cain's descendant. Cain's descendant. Amen. He was the first one to marry uh, more than one woman, and so that stayed in. It stayed in, and in, in mankind, it, you know, it, it was still a sin, but God allowed it for those reasons that I just gave to you this morning. Amen. So Esau married two young women from Canaan. The first one was Adah, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. And Ohilabah, the daughter of Anna, and the granddaughter of Zibion, the Hivite. So he married, he was in the land of Canaan, from Canaan. He married a Hittite and married a Hivite. Amen? Verse 3. He also married his cousin, his cousin, Basma, who was the daughter of Ishmael and the sister of Nebaioth. Everybody go with me to Genesis chapter 28. What is Esau doing? He's just marrying away over here. Genesis chapter 28, go to verse 1.
And when you got it, say, I got it. Yeah. Just back a few chapters. So Genesis chapter 28, verse 1, we're going to learn something today. So Isaac called for Jacob, Esau's brother, blessed him and said, you must not marry any of these who? Canaanite, Canaanite women. Oh. You must not marry any of who? Canaanite. Canaanite women. You must not marry somebody from the world. You must not marry, as a Christian brother and sister, you must not marry someone who doesn't share the same faith in Jesus Christ being our Lord and Savior. You must not marry somebody who's carnal. You must not marry somebody outside of your faith. Hallelujah. That's what Jacob was telling Isaac. You cannot, I mean, Isaac was telling Jacob, you must not marry someone outside of your faith. The Canaanites were, were immoral. They were sinful. They were worldly. They were carnal. Amen? And they worshipped idols. They had many gods. Verse 2. Instead, go, he said instead, go at once to Padan Aram. Go at once to the hand of God ministry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> go at once to the church of the true living God, to the house of your grandfather Bethuel, and marry one of your uncle Laban's daughters. Who's uncle Laban? That was the brother of Rebecca, Isaac's wife. So Jacob goes, he says, go to your uncle's place and get a wife from there because his uncle's place was of the true God. Amen. They believe in the same God they did. Verse 3, may God Almighty bless you and give you many children, and may your descendants multiply and become many nations. There was a blessing upon uh, Jacob. Uh, Isaac was pronouncing a blessing upon Jacob. May God pass on to you, your descendants, the blessing he promised to Abraham. May you own this land where you are now living as a foreigner, for God gave this land to Abraham. Amen. So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Aram to stay with his uncle Laban, his mother's brother, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean. He was being obedient. He was doing what his father told him to do, which is what God told Isaac. Amen? Verse 6. Esau knew that his father Isaac had blessed Jacob. Here's key. Esau knew that his father Isaac had blessed Jacob, his twin brother, and sent him to Padan Aram to find a wife, and that he had warned Jacob, you must not marry a Canaanite woman. Hallelujah. He also knew that Jacob had obeyed his parents and gone to Padan Aram. Why did God allow intermarrying in the same family? Marrying your sisters, marrying your cousin, marrying your half-sister. Why, why was that okay? Because remember, in the beginning, Adam and Eve were the only ones on the earth. They had children, and they had to marry each other, but the bloodline back then was pure. It was without defect. Amen. It was pure because Jesus Christ was coming through the lineage thousands of years later, so they had to keep the bloodline pure. But by the time of Moses, what happened? The bloodline had become polluted. It became de de full of defects. That's why today we're not allowed to marry in our own family. Amen. Y'all learned something today? Amen. It's no longer safe to marry within your own bloodline. Before the law was okay, law and forward not okay. Amen. So it goes on to say in verse 8, It was now very clear to Esau that his father did not like the local Canaanite women. It was clear. It was crystal. So Esau, what does he do? He visited his uncle who? Ishmael, the one whom God rejected. Mm. He visited his uncle Ishmael's family and married one of Ishmael's daughters in addition to the wives he already had. Ishmael was not the son of promise. Amen. Ishmael, remember, came from Abraham, but through Ishmael birthed the Arab nation that we have today. Came through Ishmael. So what does Esau do? Because he wanted to please his parents, because he knew Jacob was being obedient. He says, well, my brother Jacob went to my uncle Laban's house and married a woman or a daughter from that household. I'm going to go to my uncle E, my, uh, on Uncle Ishmael's house and marry somebody from that household. You understand what happened? Mm -hmm. So he's trying to go, trying to compete with his brother, but trying to please his parents. But how many know he went from bad to worse? Mm -hmm. This was the lineage that God rejected. Ishmael, he rejected. Amen? So in addition to the wives he already had, his new wife's name was Mahalath. She was the sister of Nebaioth and the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. Everybody go back with me to Genesis 36. I'm saying all this to say that unholy alliances that Esau was forming are going are gonna to have repercussions. And we're going to see that in a minute. Back with me at Genesis 36. Everybody jump down to verse 6. 
Esau took his wives, his children, his entire household, along with his livestock and cattle, all the wealth he had acquired in the land of Canaan, and moved away from his brother Jacob. Here was not enough, here was not enough land to support them both because of all the livestock and possessions they had acquired. So Esau, also known as Edom, settled in the hill country of Seir. This is the account of Esau's descendants, the Edomites who live in the hill country of Seir. Go with me to verse 15. It says, these are the descendants of Esau who became the leaders of various clans. Esau's people became leaders. God didn't appoint them leaders. They were appointing themselves. Mm. Go down, down with me to verse 19. These are the clans descended from Esau, also known as Edom, identified by their clan leaders. Now they have clan leaders. Go to verse 31. These are the kings who ruled in the land of Edom before any king ruled over the Israelites. These are the kings who ruled in the land of Edom before any king ruled over the Israelites. These were the first people to appoint kings, even before Israel. They, these were the ones that had kings first. Mm -hmm. Amen? They were the first to appoint them. They were an exalted bunch. They were a uh, uh, very arrogant bunch, so to speak. Everybody go with me to Obadiah, and I'm going to show you in scripture that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Go with me to Obadiah. Obadiah is in the Old Testament. It's several books back from Malachi right after Amos and right between Jonah and Amos. Obadiah. Chapter, go to chapter 1. This is what happened to Esau and his descendants. <laughs> because of what Esau did, because of all the unholy alliances that he formed, because of his decisions, because of his, his ways that seem right in his own eyes, these were the consequences. Obadiah was a minor prophet. Everybody know what a prophet is? He's a minor prophet, and he spoke specifically to Esau's descendants. His whole ministry was to speak to Esau's descendants, and look what happened. The Lord says to Edom, I will cut you down to size among the nations. You will be greatly despised. You have been deceived by your own pride because you live in a rock fortress. They were a proud people. That's why they were appointing themselves kings. They were appointing themselves leaders. They had it going on. Do you know while they had it going on, Jacob was slaving away over at Uncle Laban's for 20 years? <laughs> Jacob was wealthy, but his wealth didn't come overnight. His wealth was brick upon brick, layer upon layer, line upon line. Esau's wealth came quickly and overnight. It says, you've been deceived by your own pride because you live in a rock fortress and make your home in the mountains. Who can ever reach us up here? You ask boastfully. But even if you soar as high as eagles and you build your nest among the stars, I will bring you crashing down, says the Lord. Wow. Now, obviously, the judgment of God was not hell for an appointed time. He brought this whole race crashing down, this whole, I'm sorry, this whole uh, lineage crashing down because of Esau's decisions. What does that mean to us today that you're going to come crashing down? Well, we do go through trials, but we got to make sure it's not by our own hands. Trials that we know that are sent, that we didn't have anything to do with to incur that kind of suffering or the trials that bring glory because we can see God with our whole heart. But if we're in a trial and we know it's because of the decisions that we made, a decision about getting together with the wrong person or, or being with the wrong relationship, getting married to the wrong person, how many know there's consequences to that? Amen. 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 Everything feels like it's going to come crashing down. Amen. Turn the page and go to verse, verse 10. Why? We, we just discussed it, why, but I'm going to read a few scriptures to you of the reasons for Edom's punishment, the reasons for Esau's descendants' punishment. Verse 10, because of the violence you did to your close relatives in Israel. So close relatives, how were they related? Well, remember, Esau went and married into Ishmael's camp. Ish, uh, the whole camp from Jacob's camp and his descendants and Esau's descendants were at war. Because remember, Jacob's lineage was Jewish. Esau's lineage was Arab. Is that still happening today? Amen. If you don't see any, if we don't see anything else, but we see it in the Word of God, that if everything the Word of God is saying is you watch the news today and you can go all the way back thousands of years and the foundation is right there where it all began. Goes on to say in verse, let's say, uh, relatives, okay, you'll be filled with shame and destroyed forever because they mistreated them. 
Verse 15, the day is near when I, the Lord, will judge all godless nations. That judgment, when the Lord judges the nations, is when he comes back and, and splits the eastern sky and places his feet at Mount Olives at the end of Armageddon. He's going to judge all the nations. As you have done to Israel, so it will be done to you. All your evil deeds will fall back on your heads. Is Israel still being mistreated today? Amen. Yes. Amen. The attacks and the wars are on God's people today. You can trace it all the way back thousands of years in this Bible. And how can people say that the Bible's only a book? Do you know that I heard Donald Trump say this? And I'm sure may, maybe some of you heard it. I don't know. I happened to just turn it on and there he was saying something. Uh, I didn't hear the whole speech. It was something very quick. I just caught the most important part. He said... He was doing the speech and then someone lifted a book in the audience. I don't know if it was a reporter. I don't know who it was. Lifted a book up and Donald Trump says, that's one of my favorite books. It was one that he wrote. I think it's The Art of Something. I don't know the name. The Art of Something and I don't remember. But then what, what caught my eye or what caught my attention, he said, the other, my other favorite book is the Bible. Amen. He said it on national television. I almost passed out in my living room. I said, what? He said, my favorite book is the Bible. He says, the best book ever. And y'all, maybe can YouTube it. I'm, I'm just paraphrasing. I'm not even, I don't want to say the exact, but I know what he, what I heard. He said, my, my other favorite book is the Bible. I think he even said it's my number one. Or, and I said, what? When does, when does a, a president nominee these days is ever going to put that out? Especially with all the controversy with Christians and all the stuff that's going on. So I just thought that was a bold move. But you need to YouTube it because I don't. I can't say exactly why or what. I just know what I heard. I said, I, ha I have to make sure I heard that right. So I may have to go back and YouTube again. But I know what I heard. It was incredible. The Bible. Uh, the Bible. Uh, what do we say around here? The Bible stands for the acronym Basic Information Before Leaving Earth. Amen. Amen. If you don't love the Bible and you have salvation, then something's wrong. Hallelujah. Yeah. Something's wrong. Amen. Something went wrong in your walks. You got away from God. Maybe you strayed from praying. Maybe you never really read the word. The one thing we tell people, I was talking to a, a, a saint. I said, the one thing you want to do is not tell people a bunch of stuff. Lead them to the word of God because you've already told them enough stuff with your mouth. Just point them to the word of God. Start in Proverbs. Start reading Proverbs chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 2. If you need wisdom in your life, it will help you. It will change your life. If you knew who I was 20 years ago, you wouldn't recognize me today. You wouldn't. Amen. You can ask my Aunt Diana. She knows. <laughs> she was praying for me along with my mom a long time before I was ever a Christian. <clears throat> You would not recognize me. The word of God. It transforms that we just sang. Holiness is what I long for. When I gave my life to or recommitted, I say gave my life because I, I don't even know if I was ever saved. I, maybe I was and just lived in the world. But when I gave my life to the Lord in 1999 and committed my life in 1999, my life has never been the same. I would have never ever, if you told me I was going to be a pastor, I would have laughed in your face. If you had told me I was going to be preaching the word of God behind this pulpit 10 years later, or however many years later now, uh, I would have laughed in your face. I would have said, oh, you're, you're crazy. That's never going to happen. It's the word of God that transforms. It's the word of God that, uh, you know, you, you ask the Lord to come and take your will so that he, he can put his desires into yours, not have our desires and then ha help him with ours. Amen. Amen. we got to conform to his word, not him conform to our lifestyle. Amen. Amen. And that's the problem with people today. They don't want the Bible. They're tossing it aside because it doesn't conform to their lifestyle any longer. That's right. Amen. So Esau, destruction, his descendants are suffering because of decisions that he made years before. It says, the day is near when I, the Lord, will judge all the nations as you have done to Israel, so it will be done to you. All your evil deeds will fall back on your head. Mm -hmm. Go to verse, go to verse 18. We're going to finish on Obadiah at that part. The people of Israel will be a raging fire and Edom will be what? A field of dry stubble. That means complete annihilation of them. The descendants of Joseph will be a flame, the Jewish lineage, roaring across the field, devouring everything. There will be no survivors in where? Edom, which means Esau. And that was Edom. I, the Lord, have spoken. You don't want to go down a road of being alliance with someone who's not truly seeking the heart of God. In this day and age, marrying the wrong person can cost 
grave consequences, consequences, serious consequences, hurtful, hurtful consequences. Amen. And what we do up here is we preach the word. We let you live your convictions. We're your, ma we're your pastors, but we're not your masters. We can't go around making sure who you're courting and who you're dating. I say bring them to church. Amen. Bring them to church. See how long they last. If they don't last here six months at least, and then keep going after that six months before you even think about dating them. Six months in the church, you got to test their armor and see who they really are. And then I say a year before you even think. In this day and age, especially if you have children, you don't want your children to see a different man coming in and out of your household. Amen. Amen. In this day and age, got to know that you know that God has sent you this person or that's the person God has called you to be with. You've got to have the same vision. You gotta have the same the same God. Oh gosh, you gotta have the same God. I can't tell you how many people we've known since I've been a Christian. It's not, I'm not talking about being in the world because we didn't know any better back then. I can't tell you how many Christians have gotten involved with the wrong person and have suffered. Hmm. Hurtful, hurtful situations. Unspeakable things that, that people go through uh, from being married to the wrong person. It's very hurtful. And we try to preach the word so that you all will think twice and be um, prudent when it comes to wanting to date somebody. Amen. Amen. Everybody go with me to Second, yeah, Second Corinthians. Go with me there. Second Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 14. Unholy alliances, friendships from the world. It doesn't mean you isolate yourself from the world. You have to leave this earth. Not to talk to people from the world. You got to go to school, don't you? You got to go to work, don't you? You got to see people from the world that don't serve God. What do we do with them? We show them love. We show them peace. We, we're the salt and light to them. We got we to gotta show them that Jesus tastes good. We don't just start hammering away with the Bible on people that don't have Jesus. Amen. Amen? Because what? We're going to scare them away. Amen. They got to have Jesus in their heart. They got to have a measure of faith to believe on Jesus Christ. And then the measure of the Holy Ghost comes upon them. Then they can start reading the word. But if you've been saved for any length of time and you don't read your Bible, something is going to be missing in your life. You're going to be a twice dead, plucked up by the roots. That's what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Everybody there? We're going to finish off in this section. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? Amen. What kind of union can there be with somebody that's filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with Jesus Christ, and then you yearn to hang out with somebody who says they believe in God but really don't have a relationship with Him? And if you are attracted to that, to being your company, then you have to get back to the cross and find out why that is. Amen. 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 My husband and I, or I could say me, even when I first became a Christian before I was married, I didn't, I didn't go out and tell people I didn't want to hang out with them. I didn't tell my friends I love my friends. And I've met some really wonderful people along the way of my worldly lifestyle. From the time I was a teenager all the way up until I gave my life to the Lord and committed when, in 1999. I met some wonderful people. And they're on my Facebook. And I love them. You don't see me preach to them. You don't see me put any scriptures to them. You don't see all that. Because why? Because then that gives people an open door to start persecuting. Amen? They want to hear the word of God. They can come to the church or they can go on YouTube. Amen? Amen. That's just how the Lord leads us. What do we do? We show love. We just, you know, whatever, whatever it is we do, we do it with love. Our motivating factor is always going to be love. And when I, I was in, in the early part of my Christianity, I had no desire. God removed the desire to do the same things I used to do. I, I didn't know how it happened in the first year I was committed to the Lord, but it happened and I allowed it. And I said, Lord, I surrender. I'm just, I'm just going to seek you with my whole, I want everything. I want all you have for me. I'm done with the world. And I never looked back, never looked back to friends, never looked back to hang out. You know, I never look back to any of the old ways that God delivered me from. And I think that's why nine years later I became a pastor. Amen. Because the Lord saw I was serious. I didn't have no intention of being a pastor. I had no intention of wanting to sit there and receive the word of God and be blessed. But the Lord had a different plan for me. And because I yielded my life and submitted my life to him, 
he was able to use me. Amen. Not because I'm any special, anything special. I'm really not. I, I come from a worldly lifestyle like many of us do. But I, I chose to yield my entire life to the Lord. And I chose not to form unholy alliances when I was a Christian. No unholy alliances, no dating, no hanging out with men, no being with men on the phone. I said, Lord, I am done. I said, and the next man I talk to on the phone is going to be the one I marry. Amen. Right there. And the Lord, I was serious. And the time I gave up my world, everything, alcohol, everything, the time I gave all that up to the time I got married, it was two and a half years. I walked holy before the Lord and then kept on walking holy before the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about no going back to dating anyone from my past. Every phone call got shut down. Every person. The women in my life, they didn't call me anymore. I didn't tell them not to call me. I really wanted to be, you know, go come to my church, but they just didn't call me anymore because there was no interest. The world had no interest in me anymore. No unholy alliances. And the Lord blessed me for it. I, I show love. And I try to share Jesus with whoever I can and whatever, whenever the door is open. Share a little bit. Find out what's going on with people so we can see. Get Jesus into the hearts of men, men and women. Amen. 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 So he goes on to say, what harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? A person who has idols. It can be any, anything can be an idol. It can be sports. It can be. Uh, it could be uh, uh, people. People can be idols. Amen. It could be a person. Can be an idol. Money can be an idol. Your cell phones can be an idol. Facebook can be an idol. If it takes up any residence or it takes up uh, cools your affections to the to the heart of God, then at some point you have to set it aside and say, Lord, I need to submit to you. Amen. You can have an unholy alliance right in your own house with your cell phone or with your computer. Unholy alliances don't have to be in the physical realm. They can be also in pornography. Those are unholy alliances. Amen? Amen? And when you open your soul to that, it disturbs things. It makes things real muddy. And when you come around the house of God, oh, you're not going to want to be here. It's going to be, oh, you're going to be like, oh. Because why? Because sin can have no place in the presence of a holy God. How do you get rid of it? God, forgive me. I ask you to forgive me. For my eyes have seen, what my ears have heard, what my hands have touched. Just forgive me, Lord. Let me start afresh and anew today. You come in with that kind of heart, everything that's being preached is going to just sink down into your heart. It's going to take root in your heart. Hallelujah. Unholy alliances. They're dangerous. The ways thereof, the, the, the end thereof is going to be death to your circumstances. And it goes on to say this. I will, I will live in them. So he said, for we are the temple of the living God. You're the temple. Whatever you're feeding yourself, whatever you're looking at, you're going to pollute your temple if it's not holy. Amen? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I don't know why I want to say this, but my husband and I, there was, you know, we screen our movies before we go. We used to go to the movies every week. We don't go every week anymore because you can't watch the movies anymore because they're so crude and, and, and they're, so, they're just horrible. They're so improper. And, and I can deal with some language, but I can't deal with language going and going and going. So my husband and I screen all our movies now. And we can't go to the movies every week. There's nothing to watch. So we have to stay home and, you know, a little downtime. We get a movie off Netflix or get a movie off of the cinema thing that we have for DirecTV. And the movies are just getting worse and worse. Have y'all have y'all noticed that? The movies, the rated R movies have gotten so worse. You have to, they literally read and there's just no way. We can't even, we can't even go near the movie. There's just no way. There was a time when violence was okay. Uh, we just... We stay true to our convictions. And the movies are just getting, they're on another level. The rated R should be rated, you know, MAs and others. And then the PG-13 should be rated R, and the PG should be PG-13, and so have you. Amen. And I heard a pastor say this, you're trying to raise rated G or PG kids in a rated R world. That's right. It's very difficult. The day, and age, the day and age we live in, and you have flash all over the television, people that have, you know, that are not clothed. And they just have these blurry things going across people. Just on regular television. You don't, even, you don't even have to have a special premium channel to see that anymore. It's, it's, it's unbelievable what's out there. So it goes on to say, For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among 
unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Have you separated yourself from the world? Have you separated yourself from the unbelievers? Don't touch their filthy things. That's the word I wanted to use. The, the, the movies are filthy. That's the word. They're filthy. Just filthy. All you got to do is look at this. You screen it and you just know, oh, can't go there. Holy Ghost says, no, you can't go see that. And that's happened a lot more in this last year than it, than it has in the years before. He says, don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. And I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Praise Jesus. There are serious consequences to forming unholy alliances. Be sure that you seek the Lord with your whole heart. If there's somebody you're interested in, somebody you want to align yourself with, somebody you want to go into business with, somebody you want to have a friendship with, seek the Lord first. And the Lord will lead you by His Spirit. You just got to follow peace. Hallelujah. Amen. Because we know from Esau's... Uh, circumstances and his consequences they were severe from all the decisions that he made he he could have repented at any point at any time but he didn't he just kept going along with his arrogant self leading people into the same way and you see what the outcome was destruction devastation and death Amen. hallelujah close your eyes right now Father, I thank you and praise you and worship you and glorify you. For we know, Father, that your word will bring conviction, but your word will also bring life. And the Lord, we know that your word will also be, Lord, a light unto our path in this very day. I thank you, Father, for the covering today of the Holy Spirit in this place. We thank you, Lord, that we'll be able to look for red flags in any decision we make concerning unholy alliances. When you lift a red flag, Lord, we're going to know, oh, the Lord said no. We thank you, Father, for the strength for each of us here as we go forth to be careful in our relationships, to be prudent in our decisions. And we just praise you and glorify you, Lord, for this message. And we thank you that it went forth today and it went over your people. And it will bring change. It will bring conviction, Lord. And it will bring peace also, Father, to any question that's been unanswered. I'm thanking you, Jesus, and praising you and worshiping you for this message. I'm glorifying you and praising you, Lord, that understanding and wisdom has come this very hour. It's time for the body of Christ, Father, to wake up. For as me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Let's all stand to our feet.